Oh well. We're going to go with it as it is. Okay. All right. I'm going to open up our book because we were using this link that I put somewhere on my desktop. Right there. Book. Okay. Going over what you all submitted, majority of you did exactly what I asked for. A few of you have seen that we had issues with it. Remember we are going to do the hello thing? Remember that? Yeah, I don't know who's who, so I'm, but uh, I know a couple people submitted screenshots first, and a couple of them resubmitted to Python, which is fine. A um, couple people submitted the output of their program as their program, and let me show you what I'm talking about there, because uh, didn't we make a file called hello.py somewhere? Let me find mine. Here it is. You know how, well, I need to open an idle, don't I? Hit an idol. Let's go this one. Okay, so if I run this, okay, a couple people submitted that. Okay, that is not your program. That is the output of your program or the results of your program running. What I wanted to see was this. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if, I don't think I took off for it. Maybe I did. I don't know. It really depends on what the mood was. But this, there's a big difference in the Python script in the background and the output of your program in the foreground. Um, I think someone actually just submitted it in here. You know, they did this whole print, you know, hello. They submitted that. Yeah, that's not really a separate script. That's really just entering it into the interpreter, okay? Do you understand the difference? So it's really important to understand what a script is. A script is something you would write, and then you would provide to somebody, okay? Maybe you write this and then sell it to someone or provide it to someone or download it off the web, whereas the other one is not really a script. It's really inside the interpreter that when you're just entering it. Okay, I really can't save this and do anything with it. Okay, so it's just kind of important you submit the right ones. So now the installing, I'm assuming the majority of you got it finished because I think 18 of you submitted it. So any problems on that? Everybody get installed okay? Does it run? Do we try it? Okay. Uh, if it, I, I recommend you take your script that you wrote in class. Try it at home. Make sure it works because we're going to need it. And if you don't get it to work now, you might have an issue later. Okay? And please ask me questions if you got them. Um, even while I'm talking up here, raise your hand. Ask a question. I mean, I'm fine with that. I'd rather fix it now because, you know, I'll oh, say summer. Summer, isn't it? Say summer here. Maybe summer has a question and she doesn't ask it. The odds are somebody else has the same question. So just ask, and if it's stupid, I'll try not to make you look stupid, but no, just ask your questions, okay? Because it, yeah, I want to make you all succeed. You know, I'm, I, I teach cryptography tonight, and I'm going to tell them tonight, I would love to see one semester where everybody gets an A. But it's going to take work from everybody, you know? Everybody needs to participate, everybody needs to do the work, everybody needs to ask the questions. And I was grading homework last night until 6.30, had a bunch of assignments to do at midnight last night. And sure enough, I had people email me at 8.30 and 9 o'clock asking for help. I'm like, you know, you had the entire week <laughs> and all the way until 6.30 on Sunday to ask for help. And if you wait till 9 p.m. on Sunday, it's okay. They're going to complain that I didn't provide help. I'm like, come on, seriously, 9 o'clock on Sunday when it's due is a little late. But just, I can only help if I know you have questions. Okay? Kind of get what I'm getting out of all that. Okay. Let's go through this a little more. We talked about what a program was. We talked about debugging. We talked about some different types of errors. So what's a syntax error? Anybody? Just a, typo. a typo, exactly. You spelled print wrong. Okay? So what a runtime error be? Any ideas? Maybe I wrote the program. It's all syntactically correct. But I tell it to open up a file that doesn't exist. It crashes when it's running. And a semantic, that's where, that's where I tried to do, what, 2 plus 2 times 6 or something, and y y the logic's not correct. It doesn't quite do what you expected it to do. 
And that's a big issue. And, you know, I was driving here this morning, made me think about this. I have a Chevy Volt, an electric car. Absolutely love it. Never buy a regular car again in my life. But it kept beeping. Pulling out of my driveway, it beeped four times. A few minutes later, it beeped four times. It kept beeping. I was trying to figure out what it was because there was no display on the car at all telling me what was wrong. But I did have a heavier laptop sitting in the passenger seat. So I'm thinking maybe it was a, hey, you ain't plugged in your seatbelt error. But normally when it does that, it shows me a red indicator for seat number two of having a person here with no seatbelt. So um, that's what I was thinking. It's kind of like it's an error, but I don't know what the error is. So it's kind of, so hopefully when I drive home tonight, the car will work fine. But it was, it was driving me crazy. It's like, why are you beeping and not tell me what the error is? You know, it was, you know. okay. So we talked about those different types of errors. Um, you know, talk about external debugging. Um, one way to think about that is, you know, if I'm writing a program and I check everything I possibly can, then provide it to Summer again, so I think that's the only name I really know at this point, even though I've called you all a million times. But So I provide it to Summer. Do you think she might find something different than I did? Yes, it happens all the time. That's why you do beta testing. You ever heard of beta, te beta testing? Um, you all know in Windows they have the defragmenting software. Have you ever heard of defragmenting? Some of you might have, but it's built into Windows now. It'll actually defragment your hard drive. Well, when Windows NT came out years ago, it wasn't built into it. They said it didn't need it. Well, no, they just didn't figure out how to do it yet is what it was. Well, there was a company called Executive Software that did, you know, wrote software for it. And I was actually a beta tester for them. So they would always send me the new versions. I would install them and reply back. And one day I was doing it. And I got an error. It says, your volume is corrupt. Restore from backup. Kind of sounds like a bad error, doesn't it? So I contacted them and said, hey, this current build, I get this error. They were freaking out. They were like, oh, my God, what's wrong? What's?" Because they're getting ready to release the product, and there was an error in it. So they would FedEx overnight me cookies, which I was like, what? So I guess they wanted me to spend time on it. So they were overnighting me T-shirts and cookies and crap. It's like, what? Well, it turns out it was an issue with my antivirus interacting with the program. You know, it didn't quite work right. So the way they fixed it, I still think this is the stupidest fix ever. They put a line in the little help file, you know, the, that crap you all, no one ever reads. If you're running McAfee version this, and you run a program, and you get this error, just ignore it. Like, what the heck is that? But, uh, no. So... But now, so experiment or yeah, yeah, debugging is trying everything, right? You're trying everything you can, um, trying to have different OSs, stuff like that. Um, let's we we mentioned a little bit formal and informal languages. Um, formal languages more of like the math type stuff, Chemex and uh, Chemex. Got some calculators down down in my office. Some HP 35S is the model of the ca scientific calculators. And me and Roy spent about 30 minutes Sunday, it was, it was Saturday, Saturday, trying to add 2 plus 2. Couldn't do it. <laughs> Couldn't get the stupid calculator to add 2 plus 2. I'm like, what, are you a bunch of idiots or something? Well, I mentioned it to a person next door. And they're like, oh, yeah, it probably uses um, that um, other way of entering numbers. What well, actually uses something called reverse Polish notation. Notation. Or prefix notation. And uh, the moment he mentioned I'm like, I know what he's talking about. Because when I took compilers at Tulsa, we had to do things. Because just because you tell a calculator 2 plus 2, it really doesn't add 2 plus 2. It really takes the 2. Then it finds out what it's going to do with it. But it takes the other number and then adds them. Because you can't say 2 plus because there's nothing to add to at this point. So it, ta it takes the 2 as a token and holds it. Then it takes the plus and says, okay, I really can't do anything yet because I don't know what the heck to do with it. Then it takes the other two, and then it adds it. So it kind of rearranges it. And it's like if you were to see, let me show you here. Where's Notepad? Do I not have Notepad? Okay. Two plus two. Really, um, it really does it as this. Two 
but another two in the plus is the way your computer actually does it. Um, another example is, we're going to see this later on, but I could tell you, you know what a variable, you ever heard of a variable? Variables like x, okay? Remember that from math class? It's just something that could hold the value. So we'll say, for this case, x is equal to 5, okay? Now I want to write some print statements. What do you think would happen if I did plus plus, nope, that's not, yeah, yeah, plus plus x. What do you think it would print? It would actually print a 6. That's called prefix notation. It says increment x and then do something. Well, we're going to print it in this case. But if I did x plus plus, that's called postfix notation. If I was printing this, it would print x of 5 and then add a 1 to it. So it's kind of weird the way these, and you, it might not seem like a big deal, but can you imagine writing a program and you use the wrong one of those? It gives you a whole new output to your program. They both end up being 6, but this one here adds the one first, or increments it, and then does the operation in this case, which is print, where this one does the operation and then adds it. So, so this whole formal language thing really matters when you're writing software because different things work in different ways. Okay? And with that calculator, I had totally forgotten about it until he mentioned it. I'm like, oh, that's RPN. And if you actually look it up, RPN, the second one up there, reverse Polish notation. I'll tell you all about it. It's basically the way a lot of computers work. 3, 4 plus is 3 plus 4. Okay? So, just kind of a food for thought there. All right. So they talk about tokens. When working with programs, we always have tokens. That would be like the number or the variable or the operation or the method or the function. When you write programs, we have to take a lot of stuff into account here. Now, I zoomed in here to make this a little bit bigger. So we, where'd it go? I lost it now. Uh, just the police line. Sorry. Okay, like down here, where'd it go? I know it's close. Come on. Okay, here it is. Like this line here on the screen has six tokens, it says. The function name of print, then the open parenthesis, then the double quote, then a string, then double quote, and a comma, and then the 2013, another print. So basically, it's six of them. So whenever we work with programs, we possibly have to break them apart. With our higher level languages now, we don't have to do it as much, but there could be some time you need to do that. Um, my students are going on my University of Tulsa grant. They're going to take compilers on their second semester. That's when you have to learn how to do this stuff. Now Dr. there teaches you how to do it. It's just that you know, when you, until you really start thinking about it, it's, it's different. It really is. Okay. Okay, then we also have a structured statement. It says that is when the tokens are arranged a specific way. Okay. Not all that critical at this point, but you see here how they have the plus symbol equals plus. It's like I could also do, I could do uh, X plus Actually, x is 5 again. x plus equals 2. What do you think that means? What's x? What's the value of x down here? I think. I'm not the plus. What's the value? What's that? It's 7 at this point. x plus is equals 2 is called a unary operator. No, no this, is, this, is, this is a compound operator. x plus plus is unary, but x plus equals 2 means take x, add 2 to it. So why would I ever do that? So why wouldn't I just write x equals x plus 2? They are, I mean, these two statements right here are absolutely the same. Why would I ever do the first one? Anybody? What do you think? I have a question. Okay. Why doesn't 
It does. Okay, here's the example I gave Roy downstairs this morning about that. We're in the United States. We're in the imperial system. Do you all agree with that? We use miles and inches and all that stuff. That's really very hard. Okay? I was measuring, I have a concrete driveway, very long one. And every so many feet, I have wood between it. I don't know if you ever seen a... Actually, there's some even out here. There's some wood. But I have wood between it. We're trying to measure how thick the wood was needed to fit into that gap. And I measured it, and it was like 71 96th of an inch. That's a bizarre measurement. I converted it over to millimeters, and it was 21 millimeters. Wouldn't 21 be easier to manage than 71 96s? When's the last time you looked at your tape measure and saw a 96th on there? The most we ever see is possibly 30 seconds, usually only 16 It's just another way of doing it, okay? We're just so used to, okay, we count in decimal, you know, 0 through 9, and we go to 10, so and so forth. Binary is just 0 and 1. So much easier, but we're not used to doing it. Okay? This stuff here, exactly identical, but we're used to doing it the second way. All agree with that? For the majority of us, we're used to saying x is equal to x plus 2. We look at something like x plus 2, we're like, what? That's just, it's kind of like removing one level of the obscurity for the computer. The computer knows what it's doing. And by doing it the first way, the computer already understands it anyway. It's like, oh, so it doesn't have to do it for you. It already, you're kind of making it a little bit easier for the computer. And if you think about it, we're saving one character on typing, which might not sound, you know, it was a funny story on Facebook. Uh, I learned how to type on a typewriter. I mean, I'm assuming none of you did, correct? I learned on the actual manual type of this, and then it, you know, that one even. But what do we do at the end of a sentence? After we put a period, what did, what did I do? How many spaces? Two. What do they do now? Only one now. Because now we have true type fonts, and they're different. Okay? So the big deal is now do no longer put two spaces after a period because it's not the correct thing to do. So we're having to change the way we do things. Well, you know, that top one there, once you learn how to program, it's actually easier to do. If I wanted you to write x equals x plus 1, you could do that. Or you could also say x plus plus. It's the same exact thing. Now, you've taken C, is that right, or Java? Java. So she's seen this before, hopefully. It's just, once you start doing this for a living, it's something you, you know. It used to drive me crazy because I used to use this all the time, X++. plus plus. But then I went to Visual Basic and it did none, uh, no clue. It's like, huh? Now, when they came out with C Sharp, which included a lot of the Visual Basic commands, it also includes that, and I was like, phew, I can use that again. So it's just one of those, to answer your question, it's just a different way of doing it. Okay, totally different way. Europe, anyone's been to Europe? Anybody? One person? Y'all notice sales tax is included in pretty much everything? If you go to the store and it's 82 pounds or whatever they're using, it's 82 pounds. You literally hand them 82 and you can walk out. Try doing that here. No, it's 82 plus whatever percentage of tax. That's, isn't that the stupidest thing in the world? At the gas station, they don't do that. At most movie theaters, they don't do that. I noticed AMC switched recently. AMC used to be, the price shown includes tax. Now it doesn't anymore. So, but, you know, it's just, you know, the way things work and just a different way of thinking about it. And until you force yourself to start using it, you know, you're going to have an issue. <laughs> it's going to be tough on you. They show an, an example here. What's wrong with this statement here? See if I can make it bigger. Anybody know what's wrong with that statement? Parentheses are backwards. Yeah. Parentheses are backwards. So when I wrote my compiler at University of Tulsa, for instance, when I came across a closed parenthesis, shouldn't I have already had an open parenthesis? So what I do is I keep track of all these things. I kept track of what's called a vector, which is like an array. We'll learn about that stuff later. But 
when I would receive a token, I'm like, wait a minute. I got a close parenthesis. I don't have an open. So I'll generate an error at that point. Whoa, missing open parenthesis. Because everything has to be in, in order. Now, like in Java, actually, let me copy this statement out of here. Let's do some of this. Okay, in Java, say, say this was, I'll fix it so it's correct now. So, in Java, I'm reading across, and I see an open parenthesis, so I'm like, okay, I can have an open. Open is legal. Now I can see that. I can have an open quote. So I keep track of what I have. Then I have a bunch of string characters. I'm good to go. Then I have a second quote. So okay, no more quotes now because now I have a full pair. Then so I keep going through and reading each token in. When I get to this one, I say, okay, now I got a pair of parentheses. Okay. But so if I had this one, the beginning one, and I was missing the ending one, at least in Java, the moment I hit a semicolon. At that point, I say, okay, I should have a full pairs of everything. So I should have two parentheses. And in this case, I would generate an error now saying I'm missing the closing parentheses. See how that kind of works? It's, it's just a way of doing it. And for a com it might sound menial to us, but it's very important for a computer. Because if you're missing something little, it could be a big issue. All right, uh, let's move on. Ambiguity, that is a biggie. I was grading a bunch of work last night and a bunch of work this morning, and one of my students said, input expenditure. Then they said, if EXP is greater than 600, you know, print whatever. Print. So is there a problem with that? Okay, expenditure in EXP, I'd know what they were talking about. I'd know why they did it. They were trying to make it fit in the little symbol. But they're two different things. EXP and expenditure are two different things. So what if I did it this way? Would that fix it? Depends on the language. Visual Basis is now fixed. Java is not fixed. That's why you need to remove as much ambiguity as possible. Tell me exactly what you want me to do. Okay? If you want me to get expenditure with a capital E, then should I be doing something with expenditure with a capital E? I mean, I should be. That's why it's very important. Okay? If I was reading your pseudocode, your, this is like pseudocode here. Well, kind of, somewhat. I could probably figure that out. But what if you were being very precise and meant it to be that way? You see what I mean? It, I mean, there's some people I see will actually make a variable. They'll make a variable called name. Then they need to hold a different name. So they make the next variable name. Is that stupid or what? But they do it. They're like, what's well, two different variables? Yeah, but it's, I realize that it works. It's totally fine. But just looking at it, I could probably look at that and say, wait a minute, are they supposed to be the same? Or are they supposed to be different? It kind of makes it hard. So ambiguity, we want to get rid of as much as possible. It says they're full of ambiguity. We deal with it by using contextual clues. So, okay. We know what happened in Houston this weekend. I hope everybody knows. If I was to say 50 inches, what would you, and we're talking about Texas, what would you think? Rain. rain. There's a contextual clue. Houston, this weekend, 50 inches, probably rain. If I'm out in my backyard mowing or something and I said 50 inches and it didn't rain, you would probably say 50 inches. What are you talking about? The, the size of the grass? or So we really use contextual clues. But when writing programs, it's hard to do that. It's going to be very hard for the program to say, okay, wait a minute. So what have we done the 8,000 lines before? Did we say anything? No, it, that's why you don't want to do that. Okay. So formal languages are designed to be nearly or completely unambiguous. Okay. Which means that any statement has exactly one meaning. But can we possibly screw that up? Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. You ever see Windows blue screen to death? That's why. 
I mean, if there's 85 million lines of code, what are the odds they screwed something up? You know they did. Um, you know that whole assignment y'all did in class? This whole, uh, this really tough one? Print, low, and EK. Okay. Is that a good, I mean, is that complete, perfect? Would it work 100% of the time? In Python. Potentially it would. But could you honestly 100% guarantee me it's going to work every single time on every single computer with every single version of Python? Well, if someone's got Python 2, that's not going to work. Python 2, I need to remove the parentheses. Now it'll work in Python 2. So sometimes when we got these things, it's kind of like, even though you write the best piece of code ever, you can never guarantee it's going to work. I wrote, there was a news article about Game of Thrones. You all read the news article with my name in it? I provide a bunch of input, and News 9 went, or someone did, and wrote an article, and it's on the web. Well, it sounds like HBO has been using outdated equipment. Now, there's really old computers. Did you all see? You probably haven't seen I'll show you. Um, Let's find this news article. This is a news article from this year. Actually, that's not the one. Darn it. Okay, well, it's it's the new version. Of the, there it is. This auto shop is still using a Commodore 64 to power their brake equipment. Is that outdated or what? So it's been surmised that HBO is using some, of the, hopefully not that old. Okay. But I wrote that in an article that HBO is using outdated equipment. They're like, you 100% positively know that for a fact. I'm like, no. <laughs> so they changed it to it has been surmised or it, you know, many people think that they are, but they didn't want to put it in writing that HBO is using outdated equipment. You, you see the problem there? So... So it's, wording is very important, okay? Redundancy, okay? Really redundancy, it says, in order to make up ambiguity or reduce misinterpretation, natural languages employ lots of redundancy, a result that can be very verbose. In other words, we might say things a million times, okay? Like I tell my kids sometimes, it's like, what was I doing this way? We're doing something. I said, David, go do this. And something else, and something else, something else. Oh, what are you saying? I'm like, and he missed the whole part about David do the, whatever the task was. And with the computer language, should I have to repeat that? No, because the computer's not going to ignore that. Where David, on the other hand, did ignore it this weekend. So we use a lot of redundancy in the way we talk. Like I might say things five times over, hopefully getting the point across. But with a language, you shouldn't have to do that. If I said x is equal to 5, x is equal to 5. I shouldn't have to tell the computer. I should not have to put this in my code. Uh, x equals 5, something else, you know, code. x equals 5, something other code. x, e you know, equals 5, unless I want to reset x. Okay? Because I told it x is equal to 5 up here. It's not going to change. It's basically constant at this point until I do something to change it. So that's where it's a big difference. Um, literalness. It says formal languages means exactly what they say. On the other hand, natural languages are full of idioms and metaphors. And when the other shoe fell. If we're talking to a computer, it would really be thinking of a shoe fell. But if we were having a conversation, the other shoe fell, that could have meant... Well, something else happened, you know, and it has nothing to do with shoes at all, okay? All right. Now, did you all notice that a lot of times you can ask Google stuff that really, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, me and Roy, while the summer workshop was going on, since we didn't have to teach all of it, we had to fix his lawnmower. The lawnmower he got for me, actually from my mother-in-law, quit working. So it's old, not old, okay, hasn't been used in like three years. He has mowed with it once, but it quit working. So we figure maybe the gas was bad. So we take it out here in the parking lot, we tip it over, dump all the gas out, put in new gas, and it starts right up. 
So did we fix it? Good to go. So we stop it. Won't start again. So what do you do? <laughs> so then Roy's like, wait a minute. We turned it over. Sure enough, we turn the gas <laughs> over. Bar that gonna start up every time. You turn off, it won't start again. You're like, why do I have to turn this mower on its side to start it? I asked Google that. Mower will not start unless turning on its side. It knew the answer. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I was like, how does it even know that? Well, it said it's probably a clogged float in the carburetor. By turning on its side, you're dumping the gas out of the bowl in the carburetor down the throat, essentially priming the, the pump. That's what I'm doing. So I'm like, Google, you know everything. <laughs> so, you know, but that's what's happening, okay? Poetry. I'm not a poetry fan. It says, words are used for their sounds as well as their meanings, not so much in computers, okay? Uh, let's see, programming, okay, pro is the literal meaning of words is more important and the structure contributes more meaning. And we're going to talk about structure soon because if your structure's off, it could really make your program do weird things, okay? So the meaning of a program is unambiguous and literal and can be understood entirely by analysis of the tokens and structure. We should be able to look at a program and follow what it does, okay? I worked in ORMITS in the military. A-R-M-T-S stands for Aircraft Radar Maintenance Training Set. The military hired a contractor to write some software to simulate the radar system on an AWACS plane. Y'all know what AWACS is. I hear a tinker the plane with a big radar on top. Hired a contractor to write this software. And ran out of money. They spent like $20 million already and the contractor was not done. So they canceled the contract. So what do you think the contractor did with the code? Threw it away. The government bought it for a million dollars. Then hired military people to finish it. I was one of those. I worked on that for quite a few years, actually. Well, it's funny because whenever we wrote our program, we would put comments in it. We're going to see about comments in a minute. Comments, you guys are going to hate it. But I really, really think they're important. But uh, the codes, there was always comments in all the code we got, except for this one section of code. I still remember it. The code had a comment at the top that says, we have no idea what this code does whatsoever. We don't know where it fits in. We don't know what calls it. But do not remove it. Boy, if you remove that code, the program doesn't work at all. It's like, what the heck? Okay? So sometimes it says here it can be, Understood entirely by reading it, but sometimes it's very tough. Okay. We had a student, Kyle Cook, who used to work here. Actually worked up in our lab. He was one of my students. Really smart programmer. Went out to University of Tulsa. Now he actually worked. He went to work for the CIA. No, he turned down the job for the CIA to work for the NSA. Now he works at another company. But he wrote this software for the for Air Inc. It's a company over on 59th. Uh, by Boeing, and he wrote this software for them, this this one section of a program, and then he left because uh, he went to Tulsa. Well, another student got a job there doing the same exact thing. It was actually reading through the code Kyle wrote, and it was all very nice. I mean, they could follow everything. They got to this one section. They had no clue what Kyle wrote. <laughs> so they actually contacted Kyle and says, dude, what is up with this code? He's like, oh, you found it. What do you mean you found it? He goes, yeah, I tried to write this code to be the most ambiguous code ever. To make it so you couldn't understand what it did. So, and I said, yeah, you did it. We have no clue what your code does. So, it was a pretty funny story. But, uh, one other, one other topic on that. Uh, I forget the name of the company. But years ago, there was an article about it. Uh, so, if I, if a company hires me to write software for them, I should put comments in it to explain what the code does. Okay? Well, this guy didn't. He worked for a company for a number of years. He did not comment the code whatsoever. The company took him to court when he quit and proved in court that no one understood what his code did. They sued him, and they actually won and got every penny back that they ever paid him. They considered his entire employment worthless because his code was not commented. Makes sense. You know, print 
Ken is pretty simple to figure out, but some of this code gets complex. Okay. All right. First program, we did this already. Any questions on that? What was our function called in this one? Print. And this is in double quotes, so it's actually considered a string. And everything between these parentheses are what's called arguments, or whatever we're passing to the function or the method in this case. It really, function and method are different. But the problem is a lot of these languages like Python and Java, they're really the same now. So, okay. So it says here we use the print function, which actually doesn't do anything, okay? But you need to put a hello world in the middle of it. Really, again, the program doesn't do much other than print hello world. The quotation marks begin beginning and the end. They don't appear in the results because it prints whatever's between them. Okay, and here's a little bit more about comments. Okay. A pound sign in, in Python starts a comment. So you'll see here. This demo program shows off how elegant Python is. So they got all this. Okay? This is important. Okay? The reason it's important is if you're going to look at this program six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, do you think you're going to remember exactly what it does? I mean, if it's just a print in the whole world, yes. But if you wrote, say, a 500-line program, do you think a year from now you can remember everything it does? No, you're not going to. You're not. So this tells us at the top, it tells us what this program does. When I was a tinker, literally every, all of our code was stored electronically, but it was also printed out on paper. We had these huge binders with all the code in it. And in the beginning of a file, every file would have this. It had who wrote it, the last time it was updated, a brief description of what it did. We also included file names, stuff like that. And the comment I hate, by the way, so people do it all the time to me, this program meets the requirements for program two. That doesn't tell me what it does. That tells me it's the program for number two. But what is the requirements for number two? Okay. So comments are important. Now this here, this comment's on the end of a line. Actually, let's make one. I want you all to make a comment. Let's go. Bring up your hello world. You all still have that? I'm assuming you did. You wrote it in class. Can you all find that? Hopefully, if not, it's very long. If you don't know how, if, if you don't have it, I'm going to show you how to write a new one. Just go inside of Python. Bring up idle. And we clicked on start. We clicked on idle. Uh, we clicked on start. I'm sorry. Then we go to Python 3.6. Then click on... Idle Python 3.6 32-bit, and this will come up right here. Then go File New. Then type, let's put something with a comment. This, oh, wrong comment, sorry, I'm in a different language. This is my comment. And more comment. And some more. Print. Say hi this time. Print hi. Now, the cool thing about idle is when I start typing, it tells me what's going on. It's like, hey, you can have a value, you can have a separator, which we'll learn more about. Okay. Now I can have this is an inline comment. So I can put comments at the beginning of the line, the comment out the entire line. Or I can actually put them at the end of a line to tell me what this individual line does. See if this runs. I'm going to hit F5. And I'm going to save this one as comment.py. There you go. It says hi. So what happened to my comments? Right. They do Nothing. I mean, they're gone. They don't get interpreted at all. So even though I wrote my comments here in my interpreter, so I wrote all these comments here. I hate this thing going full screen all the time. So I wrote them all there. In my actual shell, in the interpreter, all I got was hi. So did comments take up space in my, in my Python code? Well, it did. But the output 
ignores it. So I wouldn't say more comments the better because I have some people who literally write an entire paragraph for every single line. This print statement calls the print method, receives the string of HI, then which is passed to the method. Then I, it's like, dude, that's a little too much. Okay, but I'd rather have that than nothing. Okay, a good rule of thumb is for every ten lines of code, you should have at least one comment. I'm not saying comment every line. Like print here is probably not needed a comment. Okay. But if you have 10 lines of code and you haven't told me what's going on, I'm assuming you're doing something in those 10 lines of code. You might want to tell me what, what you're doing at that point. Okay? Everybody kind of with me? All right. So, comments. Pretty simple stuff to do. Okay? So, you also notice we left a blank line, which we can do. Sometimes you can put these little lines there if you want to make it look better that's fine there's all kinds of different i bet let's try this let's go to python uh, coding convention in other words how should we write python code a style guide for python let's see what the actual style guide shows okay let's see can you show me an example in here somewhere So they have comments. They have a single line comment. They're talking about indenting, how indenting should be done, which we haven't got the methods and all that stuff yet. Add a comment, which will prove some distinction in the editor. Okay. Yeah, they don't tell us a lot. Oh, they tell us the maximum line, <clears throat> or 79 characters. Okay. But you can usually find information here. It says, Surrounding top level function in the class definition with two blank lines. So it's telling me I should take my code here. Well, where my code went. We haven't wrote written a function yet, but I should probably put some blank lines around. Where did my other code go? Oh, there it was. Put blank lines. It just makes it easier to read. So there's always these coding convention pages that provide you some input on what how you should make your programs look. Okay. All right, I think we finished up that. Uh, there you go. You can read through all this stuff you want. There's a glossary. No, I don't want to move on to Chapter 2 because I have a PDF here I want to talk about a little bit. Today is the 28th. Okay, let's, okay, let's talk about pseudocode a little bit here. Let me make this a little bit bigger so those of you in the cheap seats can see it. I think I put it up in the class. If I didn't, I can. Um, when writing pseudocodes, let's, first of all, let's talk about what the heck pseudocode is. Pseudocode is an English, English, English language representation of what you want the computer to do. Okay? So if I was going to write pseudocode to print my name, I would probably say print Ken. Or like you did the other day, I would say print, hello. Okay. Is that, will that work in Python just like that? No. No. Will it work in Java just like that? No. Will it work in C? Will it work in anything? No. This is just an English language representation of what I want my computer to go. Normally with pseudocode, you do stop. Nope, start, sorry. Then at the end, you do stop. You don't always have to. But like it says here, in their example here, they're starting their program. They indent. Well, they've indented a lot. Then they have their stop. It's just a way of writing it in English. So if I'm the designer, okay, think about it. There's all these shows about people that design stuff, okay? Do you really think the designers actually know how to implement everything? No. They don't. How about the architects that designed my house since I had a house built? The person who made the blueprints, do you think he could actually build that house? No. no he's the designer of it. Then somebody else takes his design and implements it. This is the design. So when someone writes a blueprint for a house, it tells them the size of the rooms, 
probably where the plumbing should be, but does it tell them exactly how to implement everything? No. My house, they, they're driving me crazy. Um, let me show you an example here. You got time? Oh, we got plenty of time. I'm going to go to Oklahoma County Assessors. If you've never seen the Assessors page, you might learn something here. Oklahoma County Assessors page. I'm going to go to live search records, live property records. Yes, I accept this stuff. I'm going to put in my address, Tree Line Drive. Okay. Now, what this will do, seriously, I don't exist. 8412, I do exist. Why are you not finding it? Fine, I'll put it in my name. It's weird, because that is my address. Okay, let's go. I actually own two houses. Let's look at this house. Okay. I want to see a picture of the pictures. The pictures aren't going to show? Seriously? They always show. Well, that's handy. Well, it should show pictures of my house right here. Naturally, it's not going to show pictures of my house. Why? Fine, let's look at my other house. Let's look at this house. I think there's something wrong with their website. Well, heck. Um, let's try Zillow. I want to show you a picture. It's kind of... Okay, will you show me a picture of it? The Zillow doesn't show pictures. Well, this is about worthless then. Okay, well, back to the design stuff I was telling you about. The blueprint showed how my house is to be made. Show me you know, the garage and all that. It really didn't tell them exactly where to run the electrical lines. Okay? Well, if I had a room, let's, uh, let's bring up this awesome program called Paint. Say, let's get a blank brush. It's fine. No, I want a brush. Uh, say I got, um, this is my house. I'm a great artist. I have a room here. I have another room here, another room here. That sucks. Then down here we got the garage. This is a bedroom. This is a bathroom. This is another bedroom. Then the rest is over on the other side of the house. Well, my fuse box comes in here. Y'all know what the fuse box is? Circuit breaker panel, fuse box, whatever. Well, if you were, if this was your blueprint, hopefully it looks a little better, and I told you to run electricity, how do you think you would do it, at least for these bedrooms? Would you literally, but I mean, would you do bedroom number one? Let's put a one here, put a two here. Would you have a circuit for bedroom one, and then a circuit for the bathroom, and a circuit for bedroom two? That's what I would assume. Now, I actually had a, an in-home generator installed, and they assumed it was done that way as well, considering the way it was labeled. Now, what this idiot electrician did was, I still hate this guy, they literally ran a circuit up here, around here, and down here. So basically you got the south wall of this room, the south wall of the bathroom, the south uh, east and north walls of this bedroom, and this is the kitchen over here. So basically you got the south wall of the kitchen all on the same circuit. Yeah, it's the stupidest thing in the world. And then they have another circuit, we'll go with green, that basically does the other part of the kitchen and also somehow connects over and does this wall here. 
And it's like, what the, who did this thing? I mean, try to figure that thing out. My house is done the same way. Yeah. I realize it saves them a lot of time because they're literally running that one piece of wire all the way around. But man, trying to work out the circuit breaker. My, I actually made a mapping by my circuit breaker panel. It says, circuit one, east wall in this room, north wall in this room, plus smoke detectors. Next one, you know, range plus master bedroom GFI outlet. It's like, who the heck decided to do this? They like tapped off here and went over there. And, but the point is this would be, this sucks, okay? And wh whoever designed this, uh, the blueprint was fine, but the implementation of the blueprint was terrible. Okay, I actually got hired to run cable for a company called Aerospace Reports, run network cable, way up Rockwell and above Lake Hefner. And I did it. I went out. When the walls were put in, you know, no sheetrock yet, I went out and put all the wiring. It was all done perfectly. I had the centralized closet. And wire literally went to every single room. They're all perfect. Then they came and put sheetrock on. They actually just sheetrocked over some of my wires. I mean, I even had the boxes on the walls with the wire hanging out. They literally just sheetrocked over top of it. And they're like, Ken, I know we told you we want an outlet on that wall. I'm like, yeah, I put one there. No, you didn't. Look, there's no outlet there. So I had to get my tone generator to connect that one end and go over and go down the wall and find the wire and where it stops. I'm like, okay, there's where it stops. So we had to cut a hole, and sure enough, my wire was there. They just sheet right over it. So people don't always implement correctly. Okay? So writing pseudocode, you want to be as precise as possible. But I wouldn't say go overboard. So in this example here, it says start. Okay, that's good. Input number. Okay, so what does that tell us? We're going to get input for a number. I mean, that's all it tells us. What type of number is it? Did it tell us at this point? Not really. But that's how it's normally done, by the way. Okay? Um, the reason it's normally done by that, because as a designer, okay, how many of you really understand the difference between integer, double, and float right now? Maybe like one or a couple of you. You don't know what the heck. I mean, did anyone buy a Pentium 66, by the way, other than me? Unless you aren't old enough. But years ago, they sold Pentium 66 processors. Well, they all came with a floating point error. The error was that about the 4,000th decimal place, there was a potential of a mathematical miscalculation. Will that bother any of you? No. But the moment you're told that you're buying a computer and has a flaw, a mathematical flaw, now does it bother you? Yeah, so everybody complained. Intel had to replace the processors. Well, the only reason they shipped them was AMD at the same time was coming out with a new processor. Intel's wasn't quite fixed, so they shipped theirs just to get ahead of AMD's. Then once we all got ours, they just sent us new processors anyway once the problem was fixed. But point behind that is as a designer you might not really even know what do I want to store that in an integer a double a float or maybe a scientific notation so some stuff you can leave up to the programmer okay now so we said so input number set my answer is equal to number times two so set my answer right here is basically saying create a variable call my answer and set its value equal to whatever my number was times 2. Okay? Easy enough there? Okay. All right. Now, you'll notice we did not say set my number up here. Well, because input my number kind of means get input and set the value of this variable to equal whatever gets input. Okay? So then we're going to output my answer. It's not a big deal. It's pretty basic. We really didn't get into how print's handled. We didn't get how math is handled. We didn't get into any of that. Um, so we want our pseudocode to give us enough detail so we know what you want done. It's kind of like I want you to build this house, but they really didn't go into 
where the electrical should be ran and all. I kind of wish they did because they would have been better than the guy who did it. Okay. The same electrical company, by the way, I hired them to run two conduits out to my pump house for my pool, one with electricity and one with network cables. So they give me a quote of eight hundred dollars. Okay. Once they were done, they sent me the bill of two thousand dollars. I'm like, whoa, what is this? I mean, you quoted me eight hundred and you charged me two thousand. The lady's like, what? I said, yeah, no, really. She goes, no, 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 two thousand is not the bill. You should have been paid like thirty two hundred bucks. Two thousand was our cost. I'm like. So yeah, we had a big argument. Don't ever hire Kelly Plumbing out of Choctaw or Nawala. <laughs> Terrible, but okay. So it says, using pseudocode involves writing down all the steps you will use in a program. Usually we preface a pseudocode with a beginning statement like start or end, you know, start, and then we end it with a stopping statement, okay? Um, it says, say, what else can I say? Some developers would write the get my number or read my number. See here? We have input. So what does input mean? Putting something in. Putting something, but how am I putting it in? Typing. It could be typing. But what if it was been reading from a file? Or what if it was something else? So input is kind of vague. Normally it is typing. And that's normally okay. My point is you don't have to be super duper, like say it's from a file. You know, connect to floppy drive A. Open file. You, know, you wouldn't want to do all that. If you want to read from a file, you'd really just say, get it put from a file. So, But it, it varies. It says some people use the word get, some people use input, some people use read. Okay. All right, and here they say, says some write set my answer equals my answer times two. Some of them use the word calculate. Some of them just put like this. We could just do my answer equals my, uh, what was it, my number. I could do that as well. Now, if I was reading this pseudocode, I'm like, huh, I don't have my answer defined at this point. So I'll probably just assume you meant the set or the whatever. So it's there's really no exact way of doing this. But it is better if we were to say set. Okay? All right, let's see what else we can get here. That'll, um, yeah, and also like console write. That's how you output to the screen in C, in C sharp. But in Python, we know it's just print. In Java, it's system that out the print line. So don't worry on how you do that, well, wherever it went this whole output. So many people, when I ask them for pseudocode, they give me Java code. Like say I'm teaching a Java class and they ask for some pseudocode, they give me system dot out dot print line parentheses my answer. That is correct in Java code, but it's not correct pseudocode. And say you're a developer in, um, I don't know, um, uh, let's see, let's pick a language, um, assembly. You're a developer in assembly. So if I give you, well, let's bring in my code here. So we have output my answer. Or system.out.println uh, my answers. So this one I'll try to spell right. Okay. They're both the same statements. The top one is pseudocode. The bottom one is Java code. But if you guys are um, assembly programmers, which one do you think would be better for me to tell you in? Pseudocode. Pseudocode, because it's really not language specific at this point. Okay? Because if I told you this one, then you're going to have to go figure out what that meant in Java and then convert it to assembly, whereas if I gave you this top one, that's in no language. You literally just do it. Do you see the reason why you would do it kind of not language specific? Okay. All right. So that's some pseudocode there. We'll play more with that. Um, they start with start and end. Okay. No punctuation is needed. 
Now, this class you're taking right now, if you took it via a different instructor, you'd be doing a lot more pseudocode. Now, let's talk about flow charts. We are going to do some more, but they're doing more. A flow chart is a graph. Yes, sir? What's the assignment I haven't decided that yet. We've got 10 minutes to decide it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, i I, I got to figure out exactly which one I want you to do, though. Okay. I'll get it here. We've got 10 minutes to do it. But I'll make sure we do it in class. So um, here is a flow chart. Input my number. So what's different between this flow chart than the pseudocode? You see this symbol? Flow chart is all about graphical. Okay? Anytime you get input or output, you put it in, is that called a parallelogram? Yeah. Okay. You put it in a parallelogram. That means input or output. Okay? This one here, a processing symbol. Anytime it's in a square rectangle, you're doing something to it. Maybe you're doing a calculation or something. In this case, we're setting an answer. Okay. Then we have an output symbol. Easy enough there? Okay. We're going to go into a whole bunch more in depth. We're going to talk about flow lines and all that stuff, but not today. So here's our, our example. I mean, you see how they work together? Okay. So which one would you prefer, pseudocode or flowchart? Most people prefer pseudocode, but there's actually software out there that will actually even write the flowchart for you. I mean, you can put in the correct symbols. And then if you write it using flowcharts, there's, there's software that will take that flowchart and you can say, now produce Java code, or now produce C code, or C++, or C sharp. You know, literally do it all for you. So it's kind of cool. All right. So let's work on some pseudocode. I want some pseudocode that will take a number. Okay. So it's going to get input for a number. So how are we going to do that? Someone help me. First of all, what should our pseudocode start with? Okay. Okay. Now I want to get input for a number, and I want the number called beginning number. Okay. So input. I'm going to end in a little. Input beginning B -E -G -I -N -N number. Normally, when you're getting input into something, you would want it to be one word. So you wouldn't put beginning number. That's kind of so. Okay. So we've got input into beginning number. Now I want to uh, get input for second number. What am, okay, I want to get another number. I want to call it second number. How would I do that? Okay, input. Everybody with me so far? So we got input for the first number. We got input for the second number. Okay? Now I want you to take those two numbers, multiply them, and store them in a variable called answer. So how do I do that? Set answer. Set answer. Two numbers multiplied. How do I do that? Set answer so I can say I could put an equal sign even or just something. But beginning number times second. So will that do it? So we're getting input for the first number. We're getting input for the second number. We're setting our answer. Now I want to print. I want it to um, print out my beginning number. I want it to say beginning number was, and then beginning number. Then I want to have second number was, and the second number. Then the answer is, and then the second, and then the answer number. How can I do that? I'll put what? That's spelt it wrong. Hold on. Begging number. B E G I N N I. Is that right? Yeah. So will that do it? 
could you read that and figure out and convert it to whatever language? Yeah. Output, beginning number was. You could put this in quotes if you wanted to. You could. You don't need to. You normally wouldn't. The reason is, if you did, then I, if I was reading this, I would assume that's a big, long string. And, you know, so. So with that, I'll put that. Okay, so how would I output the second number was, what do you think? Same way? Same thing, next line. So I copied it down. Okay, then how do I do that putting the answer? Same thing, basically, but for the answer. How about the answer is, we'll change it up. And I have a problem typing. All right, and now how would I finish this thing off? Stop. Someone says end. End is valid as well. Some people say beginning, end, stop, and start. I mean, or start and stop. I mean, I've seen them anyway. Either way is fine, as long as you're consistent. Okay. So could we convert that, you think, into whatever language? In this case, Python. Yes, we should be able to. Is there any ambiguity in there? We really didn't say what type of numbers they are, but I don't think that's going to be an issue at this point. So me as the programmer could probably figure that out. Now the only thing I could see being a problem is maybe if I'm working on uh, RSA encryption, you know, I had, the numbers are too big, so then I would have to specify something. But that's, I don't think we would need that here. Um, you could change it up and say output. Uh, you could, could see, that's just leave it like that. That's best. Okay, sound good. So that's what y'all going to put in our Dropbox. Save it as some sort of text or whatever. I don't care what you save it as. Okay, so I'm going to get down here to the Dropbox. And the thing you're going to upload is double. It's already named correctly even. Can we do it in the comments or does it need to be a file? You can do it in the comments. Comments is totally fine. If you just want to copy and paste it in the comments, that's totally fine as well. There you go. And it's due today at 150. So any questions on this? Okay, we didn't do a lot. We're going to do more with pseudocode, more with flowcharts as well. Text edit. Text edit works great. Text edit, all one word. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I normally know what you can use between. Do you have a question back there? As long as I can see that, I don't care if it's in a text file, I don't care if it's in a screenshot. I don't care if it's in the comments in D2L. Just whatever it is so I can see this. Probably the easiest way is just stick it in the comments. But if you want to save it as a text file or as a PNG or a JPEG, that's fine as well. Just so I can see that you did this. Okay. So did we finish Chapter 1 pretty much at this point? Yes. Everybody figuring out how to do this? Okay. Yeah, submitting the one that says double. Yeah, we're actually we're not doubling the number. Oh, submitted in the one that says double. My bad, sorry. Yeah, that's what he called the other one. I just don't feel like renaming everything he did. All right, you getting it? Yes, sir. Mine doesn't look like that at all. Yours doesn't. What's it look like? You don't click on class tool, course tools and then Dropbox again. 
Did it not appear at the bottom? No. Let me make sure I opened it up. Hold on. Dropbox. Dropbox. It should say B double. Yeah, it should be there. There's nothing preventing it from showing. Let me come see what you got. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording in the meantime.